When I talk about the kingdom of God, people ask me sometimes what it is and where it is. And I almost always answer by saying the kingdom of God is wherever God is king, which means it could be anywhere. It could be in your own heart. It could be in your own home. It could be in this church. It could, by God's grace, come in this city. When I was teaching fifth and sixth graders in Sunday school, I tried to make that abstract concept even more concrete by marking out on the carpeted floor of our classroom a two-foot by two-foot square with some masking tape. And when my students came in and sat down, I pointed to the square and I said, now that's the kingdom of God right there. And if you stand inside that square, God is king. You have to do whatever God says because that is the kingdom of God. One at a time, they stepped inside that square and I asked them, how does it feel in there? They said, you know, it feels almost exactly the same as standing over there or over there. I don't feel any difference. But as we talked about it, they also acknowledged that if it were true, that God was king. If God was king over their lives, if they looked to God for judgment on what they should do, what they should say, it would make a difference. Their lives would be different. As we talk, they seem to think that might be a good thing and that part of what God would want from them as loyal subjects of his kingdom was to make that kingdom a little larger to get a little more masking tape and increase the size of the square till it filled up the whole classroom, the whole church, even that little town where we lived until everywhere within that square, God was king. It was that kind of thing Jesus was talking about when he said that the kingdom of God had come near. It wasn't here yet, but the time had at last been fulfilled and the kingdom of God was waiting just outside the door. All that was needed for God's kingdom to come was for God's people to get up and open that door. I was talking to some of the staff last week and pointed out that in Mark's gospel, Jesus has authority over the forces of nature and over the forces of evil, but no authority over the human heart. God can, through Jesus, curse a fig tree and cause it to wither, can calm the wind and the waves, can cast out demons and rebuke Satan, but Jesus had no authority whatsoever over the human heart. He can bring the kingdom to the front door. He can knock till his knuckles are bloody, but there is nothing he can do to force you to get out of that chair and answer. And this is why he says in the gospel, repent and believe. It's not a command. It's an invitation. The word that he uses for repent is metanoia. It's a head word. It means to change your mind about something. If you thought you knew how God's kingdom was going to come, if you thought it was going to come through God's Messiah, who would chase the Romans out of Israel and restore that nation to its former glory, think again, Jesus says. If you think that God's kingdom is going to come with the sound of swords, loud clashing, and roll of stirring drums, change your mind. If you thought that the kingdom would come with the blast of a trumpet and stars falling from heaven, think again. If you thought it was going to come with God's voice thundering in your ears, demanding your life, forcing you to change your mind, think again. The kingdom of God comes with a gentle knock. It waits for your response. On this day, let me urge you to do it, to get up out of your chair, to open the door, to let God's kingdom in. Jesus said, finally, believe in this good news. The word that he uses for believe is the word pistuo. It is a heart word. And what it involves is getting down off the throne in the throne room of your own heart and letting God sit there instead so that what he says goes so that he really does become the king of your life. So that there, at least, in your heart, God's kingdom comes. We Christians believe that one day the Jesus who came will come again. 
and that when he does, it will not be with a gentle knock on the door, but with power and great glory. On that day, he will not beg us to repent. He will not invite us to believe. He will not say the kingdom has come near. He will say the kingdom has come. It is here, it is now, and woe to the one who waits till that day to make a decision. For all the excitement about what is happening in Washington this week, for all the talk about how the time has been fulfilled and Martin's dream has finally come true, I want you to recognize that something far more significant could happen right here, right now. Someone who is listening to this sermon could decide that the time has come to step down off the throne and let God sit there instead. And this is always the way it happens. It doesn't show up on the front page of the newspapers. It is not broadcast on CNN. The kingdom of God comes secretly, quietly, one human heart at a time. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we pray that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can almost feel the presence of that kingdom. It's just outside the door. And yet here we sit in our seats, refusing to get up and answer. I pray that on this day we would find the courage to let your kingdom come. That we would run to the door. That we would throw it open. That we would invite you in and ask you to rule over us. Let your will be done in our lives. Let your kingdom come among us. May it come this day, we pray. In your name. Amen.